So, good morning. I want to present you our clinical case. Uh, this is about a male, 56 years old, without any relevant medical or surgical background and without usual uh, medication. He attended to a urology consultation on January 2016 with a PSA 8.1 and he was asymptomatic. At physical examination, he had the digital rectal exam perfectly normal. He uh, was submitted to a prostate transrectal biopsy on February uh, with a Gleason 7, 3 plus 4, and 4 cores. And it was submitted then to a prostate multiparametric MRI on March with a prostate 30 cc and with a lesion 6 millimeters peripheral classified PIRATS 4 on left lobe without evidence of local invasion or positive lymph, lymph nodes. The bone scan uh, had no ev evidence of metastasis. So it is proposed to a laparoscopic extraperitoneal radical prostatectomy and it will be performed by Dr. Renaud Bollens. Okay. We can start or I wait? Okay, perfect. Well, I'm online, perfect. Can you take here? You can take on this side. Okay, scissors. Well, uh, I have wait to to try to show you how to to create the space. Okay. As you can see here, I have done a skin incision from the midline to the right side. <laughs> to the right to, to the right side. <laughs> Well, I say, I repeat, because here it's a little bit on the market, everybody's speaking, and it's a little bit low. Okay. You see the midline is here, and inside the skin from the midline to the right side, and I have already catched in the true grasp the anterior layers of the aponevrosis. The idea is to incise the, that layer to arrive uh, close to the right rectus abdominalis muscle. I just release it a bit just to cut, and then after I show you the next step, a uh, grasp for me, anatomical grasp. We will please. Okay, what we see here, this is the muscle's fibers, and if I push with my scissors, behind, you see the white tissue appears there. This is the Douglas arch, and I will use the Douglas arch to push my port safely to avoid to enter inside the, this is where we see very well the Douglas arch now. Huh? And uh, I will use that uh, structure with strong to enter in the space with my optic. I just want to put one U-shaped suture, suture just to ensure the air tightness. We can place a gas uh, high flow. Okay, can you take the camera? Take the camera. One second. What you see on the screen is uh, the Douglas arch that we see very well. High floor. Yes. Massimo, okay. Why we have just enough pressure? Oh, the, the, the limiting pressure must be uh, higher. Yes, if you don't start, okay, it will be better. It was the, the impression that I have, it was no pressure. As you can see here, this is a Douglas arch. I push my optic on the Douglas arch, and I just follow the space to enter in the radius space. At this level, it's a first pitfalls, because we have uh, always a piece of fat of the wall, and the mistake is to stay close to the muscle and to free all this fat. It's important to try to have this fat who stay attached to the patient's muscles. And I use just the optic for the moment to open the space between the pubic bone and the two epigastric artery. The movement is I push inside and when after I'm close to the tissue, I push down. Okay, and I push gently the tissue. We don't need to go deeper than the pubic bone because at this level we have, a vessel, we have vessels who can bleed. This is already the left arch of the, the, um, the pubic bone. Okay, you see the space is uh, creating easily. 
The advantage to use the optic is also to avoid to have a risk of uh, a blind injury of a vessel. Okay. The other problem that we can have for a beginner is to open just the half right side. It's important to be sure that the left side is also well open. Can you take the camera? Five millimeters port. I enter with the suprapubic port, uh, uh, five millimeters suprapubicly. This port will help me to create the space laterally. Yes, it's always a bit higher than what we expect. Okay, good. No, the second step is to create the passage on the right side. You see here there is a Douglas arch. I just follow the Douglas arch and I push up the tissue because I want to see where is the attachment of the Douglas arch on the muscle. Do you see this attachment there? Okay, I, no. it, I don't know if we have a we moderator. Okay. It's a, a very important landmark because just medial to the, this attachment here in this fat, I know that we should have, we have the epigastric vessel. Do you see the epigastric vessels, the vein and the biting of the artery? And it runs medial to the attachment of the Douglas arch. It's for this reason that it's important to locate the attachment of the Douglas arch is to be sure that we don't free the uh, epigastric vessels from the wall who can bleed uh, nicely because uh, we have all the vessel who goes from the epigastric vessel to the muscle. The bipolar grasp. <coughs> no, I enter in the super with the suprapubic uh, through the suprapubic port my grasp. I have an external landmark. The external landmark is um, the anterior iliac crest. Oh, the tissue is a little bit fibrotic here. Okay, the grasp is there. Uh, with my grasp, I just enter under the... Oops, we have a Larsen. Can we see inside? Because we have only the outside vision. Oh my God. Internal vision, please. Is it possible to have the view inside? I explained a lot of things just for nothing. We have, do you have the internal view? Yes, now, yes. Okay, you have missed all the beginning. <laughs> this is nice. Well, I repeat. I free the Douglas arch and I locate the attachment of the Douglas arch on the muscle. Because just medial to that, I have the epigastric arteries. Okay, and I must create the space more lateral. And for that, I pass just under the Douglas arch to create a space in the Bogros space. You see that? I can enter my camera inside and now with just lateral traction and pushing down, normally I will open the space more lateral than the, the epigastric vessel. I need this access to enter my ports laterally enough to have enough triangulation. Okay, and I just use the camera for that. Okay, that's it. What we see here, this is the reflection of the peritoneum in the inguinal ring. I just want to increase a bit the window where the port will pass. And now I can use this grasp to lift up the epigastric. The epigastric is just here. I lift up the epigastric and it gives me an advantage because from outside... Can you take the camera, Raquel? Yes. The anterior the crest, we need to clean the lens. Uh, okay, the anterior crest, it's here. Okay, and I lift up with my grasp, and I can feel that the tip of my grasp arrive at this level. Anterior crest, the tip of my grasp, it's here. Then, if I incise from the tip to outside, I can enter my port, just enter this port, under the, the first uh, grasp or lift the epigastric. Okay, camera inside now. <coughs> no, it was better on the other side. Strange, but that's like that. We need to clean the lens. Okay, can you take here? I lift up my grasp and I will enter just under parallel to the other one. I 
try to show you better. Please show us the endoscopic view again. There, there you go. Good. You don't have the endoscopic now, view. Now we do, now we do. Renault, this is Evangelos Liatsikos. Can I ask you something? Do you ever use the balloon to, dis to dissect this extraperitoneal mm -hmm. space? Uh, do, do you use what? The balloon for the extraperitoneal space. No, never. It, ex is it an economical reason? Or? It's economical, it's not faster, and it's more dangerous. This is my point of view, and I think that uh, if you don't need, I think that it's uh, not necessary to use. Also, the balloon, finally, you just open the space, but you don't use the knowledge of the anatomy. And I think that the big advantage of the technique that I use is uh, just to use the, the knowledge of the anatomy. It makes the life more easy. And finally, it's not so difficult if you know the, the small tips and tricks of the technique. And what I do with the suprapubic catheter, uh, with the suprapubic port, I just lift up the tissue and I push down the, the, the peritoneum away. I just open my eyes to see where the plane wants to be opened. You see, this is the peritoneum. And if I follow, I will find the muscle soon. The muscle is there. Okay, I just lift up and push down, and then with the camera, we can give a third direction of traction. Okay, third direction of traction, and you see that very quickly, we have exactly the window that we need. With the superapubic uh, grasp, I can lift up the epigastric vessel just to protect the epigastric vessel. I hope to, to give you a better vision now. Okay, the epigastric vessel is in this tissue. I just lift up, and with the external view, with the external, I can feel the tip of my grasp. I incise from the tip to outside, and I enter my port parallel to the other one, just under, and normally the tip should arrive just in the window that I dissect. You see that? It's the manner to avoid to injure the epigastric or the peritoneum. Then the last port is uh, the most dangerous because uh, its place is located close to the, the epigastric artery. And it's the reason why I always enter my optic on the right side. Because I know that the Douglas arch are attached medially. And if I pass to the left, I have uh, 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 a dead angle on this side. Okay, and I cannot control the bleeding. Can you take the camera? The knife for me? Yes, and the last five. Thanks. Okay, camera inside. I push the port more deep to be deeper than the Douglas out. Do you see the space that we have here? For the moment, the patient has zero degree of Trendelenburg. And this is also the big advantage. We must clean the lens, it's not perfectly clean. It's also the big advantage, not with a cold one, I want uh, hot water and a dry. It's a big advantage because we don't need uh, so acute Trendelenburg position. I think it should be interesting to show the Trendelenburg position in my neighbor. Probably the head of the patients are in the floor, on the floor. But the advantage with the acute Trendelenburg position for the surgeon is also to minimize the venous bleeding. But I need uh, some Trendelenburg a little bit here. Re I have the table lower and um, uh, Trendelenburg a little bit, yes. Yes? What do you do if for some reason there is some uh, leak into the peritoneum when you have the bowel, the peritoneum pushing your, uh, let's say, your decreasing your extra peritoneal space and coming towards you? Is there yeah. any trick you do for yes, that? Yes, of course. Uh, may I have the Trendelenburg? Yes, and table down, lower as possible. Yes, in fact, the, the, a little bit more. Yeah, okay, and down. Yeah. And um, the, no, the trick is, um, the first thing is you cannot have the peritoneum under pressure. Because if you have a pneumoperitoneum under pressure, the space disappears completely. Then if you have that situation, the best is to open largely the peritoneum to have the same pressure on both sides. And the second I can use, I use usually the suprapubic port to retract the peritoneum if it's happen. I think that clearly for obese patient, the extra peritoneal approach is much better. 
well, recognize already the underbelly fascia on this side. I want to try to be drier as possible with all the, the small bleeding. The first thing that I do is to open a bit more the space laterally along the iliac vessels. Oh, movement, we are close to the nerve there. I has a small area here in the um, obturatory fossa. Attention for this big vein. You see that? No, oh, it's a very big one. Huh? Special model just for today. Yeah, it's just a big vein. That's interesting because maybe the dorsal vein will be not at the usual place. Attention, no, don't stay just where it bleeds. I always be just a bit lower. Well, when I re fat that, when I want to defat the, the tissue, I found the endopathic fascia and I push medially the fat. Okay, it's to try to have a, a, a nice view on the prostate. Attention, here we have another vein. Okay, can you stretch down here with a section? Yes, perfect. It's a small prostate. This is a good news for me. And I push medially the fat until that I arrive on the pubopostatic ligament. This is the pubopostatic ligament on the right. Now we can do the same on the left. It's a very small prostate. This is the left pubopostatic ligament. Oh my God, you see the vein there? <laughs> it's a monster. Well, when it's done, when all the fat is pushed medially and I see very well the pubopostatic ligament, I can go medially to find the, the superficial vein. Normally the superficial vein start between the two pubopostatic ligament and enter in the blood and neck. But sometimes you can have some anatomical variation. It's exactly what I suspect. <coughs> when I start, the big vein that I coagulate here is a branch of the dorsal vein. And you see that the dorsal vein goes directly in the obturatory fossa. It's one anatomical variation that we can observe. Okay. Well, it will maybe make my life more easy because normally we must coagulate and divide the dorsal vein there. But in this case, maybe we can left like that. I don't know yet if it, I will need to do more. If it's continue like that, it will be not a very challenging case. The table is the lowest position as possible, yes? Well, now we must start with the dissection. Uh, I do something different because I know that the Normally, people open first the endopelvic fascia and then they put a stitch. I don't like to do that because sometimes you have a bleeding there that we cannot control very well. And then after the dissection of the blood, it bleeds uh, during the, the dissection. And I think that it's more easy to start for the extrapenal approach with the, the, the blood and neck directly. If you can see to locate the blood and neck, two tricks. The first is to look the fibers who come from both people prostatic ligament and who makes like a V just at the blood and neck. For me, the blood and neck is here. This is the first possibility. The second possibility is to mobilize the catheter, not with just traction, because when you just put traction, as you can see, everything moves. You must first push inside the blood the catheter, and then you look where the balloon stop. And when you push in and move back, you see that the balloon stop exactly at the, the tip of the V. And for me, it's, uh, it's uh, evident that the blood and neck is there. Another remark, where so it's everything is in the detail, huh, in the, this kind of surgery. Uh, it's important to don't fill more than 10 milliliters the, ba the balloon because if you have a, a balloon of uh, the catheter who is too fill, too, too full, you, you have the risk of uh, entering directly in the blood and neck. Also, be careful to don't have tension on the bag because with the tension, the balloon is uh, pushing on the, the prostate and then it's more difficult to pass. Okay, what I do, I, it's important to consider that it will be always more easy to dissect the right side of the prostate due to the position of the scissors than the left. It's important to know the, the, the leak point of the procedure to try to compensate this fact. Is the reason why the right side is always done first. 
for the first part, I want just to open this part which is located uh, anteriorly to the urethra. And for that, I take the bladder, I verticalize to give tension, and my assistant will follow, no, you follow my, my uh, scissors with the suction, okay? Already, my friend Cogabardi, do you, do you want to spare the bladder neck or not? Uh, yes, uh, usually I try just to save time, but it's not a major issue, it's not for the continents, I think that now it's well known. And, uh, but it saves time if I preserve the bladder neck. But if I have a doubt, we can remove the bladder neck, but I will need after to rebuild it. As you can see, when I put tension, it's the traction who open the plane, it's not my monopolar scissors. You see, I put just tension, look what's happened. The plane step by step is opening. And finally what I do, I just open my eyes and I follow the tissue who show me where it wants to be open. Do you see that? I'm here today, it's uh, more evident. Then I can coagulate and push. I try always to be dry. The movement to push is, uh, uh, is what I explained to my fellows, it's small monopolar coagulation and then I push. The problem is always how to push. In fact, what I try to explain to them is um, the movement is a part of the elliptic movement and you must imagine that the two centers of the ellipse is parallel to the plane that you want to open. And here the movement is pushing inside and down and a little bit more vertically that the movement that you push in. I know that it seems a little bit esoteric like that, but when you have the instrument in the hand, you, it, it became more easy to, to understand. The other thing also is always you must push on the tissue like if you open a book. You must imagine how the plane must be open, and you must imagine that it's a book, and you push on one page of the book. Because sometimes, naturally, we have the trend to push just in the wrong direction. It's the reason why it's not so efficient. Okay, I continue a little bit more. I'm not yet on the ray tram. The urethra appears here normally. I'm surprised because I expect to be already in the urethra for 30 grams of prostate. Yes, this is the fibers of the urethra. That's here. Do you see that? The vertical fibers. I have something who bleeds from the bladder. Can you check here? Yeah, clean it here. Yeah, I think that I will take a grass to retract a little bit the bladder neck. Well, when we arrive at the level of the retra with the traction on the bladder, it's not possible to be efficient on the tissue that I want to dissect. Section. Then I will need now to deplace my hand to open the space on both sides of the retra. Section just here. Bruno, the yes. stroker you have uh, pushing the bladder up, does it clash with your other instruments? No, because uh, my optic is placed a little bit on the right side of the balacus, if you remember. Then my instrument is not exactly in the same axis. But sometimes I must deplace a little bit the orientation of the, of the grasp to retract the bladder. It's bleed a little bit on the corner, yeah. Okay, release. It's a vein that we stretch probably with the tension. Okay, section here. Okay. I try to maintain the feel. I want to cut that one because if not, we will have uh, the same bleeding in a few minutes. Okay, as uh, what I told you. <laughs> Sometimes it's better to cut a vessel instead to left uh, under tension, section here. Do you see the fat here? And this fat is important because it's my best friend to know where is the posterior part of my bladder neck. Do you see that? What I do, I start from this fat and I incise medially and I try to stay in this fat. Oh, big vein there behind. It's a little bit the maneuver that Richard will do, but he does the same without the anterior dissection. He jumps directly at this level. It's a very interesting, but I think that if you have a bleeding there, 
is probably the only one who is able to, to manage that problem there. Okay, what we see here is already a seminal vesicle, the right one. Today the case uh, seems to be nice for me. Okay, I will not touch more, but this one is already the seminal vesicle uh, and the vast difference. Now we can go on the other side. And I know that particularly when the prostate is big, sometimes it's not so easy to arrive on the good plane as I've done on the, the other side, but it doesn't matter. I have a good landmarks on the left. If I cannot find the seminal vesicle on this side, the goal is just to pass behind the retra to prepare the section of the retra. Okay. I just dissect with my grasp to free a little bit the posterior part of the retra. I don't push too much because usually when I start with my grasp here, I, I, don't, I, I push my, the tip of my grasp between the capsules and the prostate and the adenoma. Uh, it's maybe the reason why it's bleed a little bit here. Okay. Now we have a good vision. Don't sleep like that, Cipri. Okay. We have a good vision on the urethra. It's time to cut the urethra. Okay. You see that? Then I cut the urethra. You have the long fibers of the urethra here. The mistake is to try to preserve the long stump of the bladder of the urethra. If you do that, you have an uh, overcontinent bladder, and then during all the surgery, the bladder became full and you will be in trouble, okay? Section here. I just cut the fibers. And no, don't pull with the section. I don't want that because you have a risk to destroy. And now, when the anterior part is down, I go in the direction of the prostate to let open laterally to try to preserve the bladder. Reduce the tension with the grasp. It's a bit too tend. Okay, we can remove the catheter. I think that I pull a little bit too much on the uh, on the on the um, bladder neck with my grasp, and then I a little bit dilate the the bladder neck. Maybe I will need to close it a bit. Yeah, it's exactly what I believe. You remember the passage that I done that I did before is to make my life more easy now. Well. Blood and egg, well, it will be necessary to close out a bit. Okay, but there's a middle section here. What I do know, I restart from the place where I know that I was normally on the good place, and I just free from here the posterior attachment of the blood and neck. Okay, this is interesting because you see these vertical fibers. It's well known that it's not the Donon Villiers fascia, no, it's the Charlebel muscle. In fact, it's a part of the detrusor muscle. It must be incised horizontally to form the senal vesicle behind. Yeah, it's thicker than I expect. Section deeper, yeah. Stretch down. Okay, is there? We see already a section here. The, the vast difference. I free completely the fibers. So have a good access on the signal vesicles are located a little bit more laterally. Okay, and I try always to control all the bleeding. If I can, it's better for the vision. Well, today the case is uh, maybe too easy. It's uh, because yesterday it was a very difficult case that I have. Then I finished with the easy case section here. Yeah. Well, the problem is never the dissection of the vas. The problem is always the dissection of the seminal vesicle. Okay. The trick for me is to be focused on the seminal vesicle before to cut the vas. What I do, I incise vertically between the two vast difference. And then I turn on the, the right and the left to free the Donon Villiers fascia from the vast difference, but more important, from the seminal vesicle. Do you see that? The vas is here, seminal vesicle is there. When we do that, we increase the mobility of the seminal vesicle before to release the vast difference. And if we are if, we, if the seminal vesicle is not too long, 
it's uh, normally possible to arrive more or less on the tip of the seminal vesicle. There's a vessel with behind. Okay, now I can go anteriorly. When you go anteriorly, it's also important to remember that the biggest pickle that we have between the vas and the seminal vesicle run just at this level. It's also the reason why I say always to my fellows, be careful when you arrive there, it can bleed. The second thing also, if you dissect at this level, you finish to release completely the vas from the seminal vesicle. Okay, is, uh, the key is to stay procedurally. Yeah. Okay, the tip is there. This is clear. Tip of seminal vesicle there. Then now I will be authorized to cut the vas. I cut the vas with the cold knife because normally the vas itself is not vascularized. Okay, clip is the uh, scissors. Voila. Is the vessels who are behind the vas who can bleed. I take all this pedicle on block with the bipolar. I try already clips or no clips or bipolar. It changed nothing for the result for me. Okay. Renaud, wh why are you insisting on saying that you're cutting the vas with cold uh, scissors? Well, what would the difference be if you just coagulate it? Ah, because it gives a lot of smoke. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, it's, uh, I, I think that it's important to use the knowledge, w the lesson that we have, uh, the anatomic lesson that we have uh, with, the, with the laparoscopic surgery to uh, improve the quality of the, the surgery. And if you don't need to coagulate, because of course we, we can pass everything to, to the fire, but if it's not mandatory, I think that is maybe better to avoid. Also, the movements are more precise, but it's, it's right. As I told you, as I told to everybody always, it's uh, like the Bolognese sauce recipes. You have uh, thousands of recipes, but uh, it's my recipe. <laughs> Well, here uh, probably I, I cannot show you exactly what I want because uh, unfortunately I have already controlled the, dorsal, the, the, the apex of the seminal vesicle. Normally we have a, a pedicle on the tip of the seminal vesicle and probably when I coagulate the pedicle before to cut the vas, I have already controlled that pedicle. But normally it should be like if we have a vessel on the tip that you must lift up to divide the vessel from the seminal vesicle. Here is not... Uh, exactly like uh, usual, but well, it moves on faster. It's a good news for me. No, I pull. Also, a uh, very important thing, it's important to pull the seminal vesicle out. Usually, the, the trend is to push inside it to lift up like that, but we see nothing, of course. We, it's very important to pull the, the tissue out. It's also a mistake of, uh, of the beginner. Small coagulation, I push and I change the position of my hand to make my life more easy about the exposure. Sometimes we have a vessel here, but it seems to be not significant today. Okay, that one is down. The other one, I replace this one there, okay. The same principles, I peel first the donovillis fascia from the seminal vesicle. Today it's too easy, it's not the real life. And as I told you on this side, be careful because of the vessel, exactly what I say before. <laughs> I can cut the vas just after I have the pedicle who must be coagulated. It's okay, it's okay, yeah. Well, here maybe I will show you the, the vessels on the tip. 
because I arrive a little bit more higher, or the signal vesicle seems a little bit longer. Yes, it's much longer. Okay. Oh, it's a very long one, huh? You play a section here. René, what do you think about the despairing of the tip of the seminal vesicle in order to improve uh, the potency? Good question. Uh, well, I don't know. It's like the fashion. It was uh, the point of discussion years ago. I think that it was maybe more an answer about the technical problem of the dissection of the tip than a real uh, discussion about functions. Of course, more you preserved, more you have a chance to have a functioning better improvement. But I think that you must also put in balance the risk of uh, specific complication that you create. And I remember one patient uh, with the seminal vesicle still in place, and uh, he developed a nice uh, huge cyst of the tip of the seminal vesicle, and it was a mess after to treat him because he was symptomatic. And it's always the same, huh? when it works well, why not? But we cannot be sure that you will not create some specific problem who can be a, a nightmare after. Well. I don't know how many people know continue to preserve the tip of the seminal vesicle, but I think that it disappeared from the from the Congress. Huh? I, I don't know. Do you know somebody? Uh, Sometime in patient with a very long seminal vesicle <clears throat> is very difficult uh, with a central approach like your <clears throat> to spare the nerve that are the tip, and so if you left uh, a little bit of the tip, uh, I believe, uh, is better for the uh, potency, but uh, depend on the patient. In this, uh, in this case, uh, the seminal vesicle is not too ah. big, and so I think it's you know, good. Uh, what do you do? Well, uh, first of all, in all my life, I just think if it's right, but in all my life, I never preserved the tip of, I never need to preserve the tip of the seminal vesicle because it was not feasible. This is the first. The, the second, uh, the, the trick, I think, of course, if you go very large around the senile vesicle, you have more risk to destroy the, the, the nerves. And maybe it's a, an advantage with the extra peritoneal approach because we don't incise largely the peritoneum. We can clean the lens. We don't incise largely the Douglas pouch to have an access on the senile vesicle. And uh, maybe it's the reason why I never see any difference. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm obliged, finally, with this approach to stay really close to the seminal vesicle. I cannot go away from the seminal vesicle. It's maybe the reason why I don't have the impression that that uh, the preservation uh, really changed uh, in the preperitoneal pre 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 approach. And uh, not outside. Okay, as you can see here, this is on the pelvic fascia section here. It's interesting also a, a small detail of knowledge that we acquire. In the past, I remember that when I was young, my tutor explained that it was two layers of the endopelvic fascia, one covering the muscle, the other one covering the prostate. But with laparoscopy, I have the impression that it's not so, so simple. For me, it's more like a cul-de-sac, a posterolateral cul-de-sac of the endopelvic fascia, because if I push here, I'm able to open. And in this space, posteriorly, I never have a vessel who pass from the prostate to the, the, the muscle. But when I try to push higher here, I can push really strongly. It's very hard to, to open that space. And finally, I have another vision. It's uh, more just the muscle's fibers. But what I do know, I cut from this to the external part of the pubopostatic ligament vertically, because I don't preserve the pubopostatic ligament. But I must be careful because just behind here, somewhere, I have the vessel, this one is here, who pass from the muscle to the prostate. And I know that at this level, I must be careful. Well, this vessel is always there, I think. Eh? We can say always, so we can never say always, but in my experience, you can expect that in 90% uh, of cases. You see the muscle fibers who are here. I want just also to try to preserve it. I don't know if it will really be possible, but I believe I have a vein there also. 
I believe that this muscle participates to the suspension to the, of the, the, the retra, and I like to preserve it if I can. Push up the fiber. Okay, this is good. And then I cut the pyroposatic ligament. Ah, I have still muscle fibers here, yeah. Okay, good. It's because I move up higher. Pleno? Yes. Uh, can you explain why you prefer to mm, cut the endopelvic fascia in this time and not? Uh, and not before because look you see all the vein there no, usually if you dissect first you would make to pass a stitch here if I have a bleeding who is not perfectly controlled from here you have always the small bleeding falling in the blood and neck when I dissect the blood and neck then when I I control the dorsal plexus here no I don't have this risk and uh, I am in the best position as possible to dissect the blood and neck and the seminal vesicle but of course, it's always the same. If I don't have a bleeding there, it doesn't matter if I start from one side or the other one. But if I start to bleed, I know that it will be more difficult. It's also a general rule in laparoscopy. Uh, usually, it's more important to start with the, the, the part of the dissection which is in the lowest part of the breathing field um, to have a, a better control and a logical approach of the dissection. It's always the lowest part. For me, huh? but one more time is uh, my recipe. But finally, the problem is uh, I, I do that after reflection, but many people just repeat the, what they see and they never think about that maybe it's not the more logical things. Big vein here will enter inside the, the apex. That one I will need to sacrifice. I'm pretty sure, yeah, it's just vein. And the muscle fibers here, as in the other side. Rene, do you cut uh, the pubopostatic ligament? Someone prefer to spare uh, the pubopostatic ligament. What is the reason? Uh, for, for this cutting, because you have the, mm, well, more view in the in the stitch when you pass the stitch. Yeah, I, mm. I, I prefer to move it because I have the impression that I have a, a better vision on the apex when I cut the apex. When I tighten the with the prepositional ligament in place, you have like a kind of retraction of the of the the prepositional ligament while tied together and the apex is moving is moving up and then when you need to cut the tissue you have less space and is my impression the second point is always a question about the stability of the retra but for me the key problem of the stability of the retra is not the anterior one the anterior part because the anterior part is still fixed huh? remember that we have the suspensory ligament of the penis on the other side the last one at least and uh, finally, I think that the mobility of the urethra concerns more the posterior part of the urethra. And I've already tried to preserve the, the pyroposatic ligament in the past, in the, in the early experience in the, at the end of the 90s. But I don't feel that it gives a real improvement of the, the continents. As I say always, if you need a double blind study with uh, 2,000 cases to prove that something is uh, working, it's not a good uh, technique. I think that uh, if you have really found something interesting, you m it's the nurses who must tell you that they see the difference when they remove the bladder catheter and not a long study with uh, 1,000 cases just to prove that you have 2% uh, of significance of improvement uh, of the continents. But for me, it doesn't work. This is uh, my impression. Big suture? No, no, the back will... Uh, I think after more than 15 years of radical prostatectomy, my impression 
one more time, I don't have done a huge uh, randomized prospective study, but my impression is the key are probably the length of the urethra and the posterior uh, stabilization of the urethra, plus, of course, all the neurological problems that we can have uh, when we dissect uh, for real uh, large uh, cancer. But the key for me is uh, the, this two point. Because the retra here is stable, is the posterior part of the retra will be mobile. I see the use of Benike. I think it is a good uh, um, instrument in order to avoid uh, <clears throat> to pass the stitch through the urethra at the beginning, and they can push down the, the prostate and uh, expose better the, yes, for the space. I agree with you, I use the Benike too. I think that the Benike is very, finally, the Benike is like if you have one instrument more, because you can. Uh, feel the, the, the retra, but you can also mobilize the prostate, left, right. And more important, if you have a big bleeding there, you lift up and you compress and you stop the bleeding, that you have more time to manage the problem, to prepare the suture. And for me, it's, uh, it's a good help, yes. Well, one problem here is how to place the stitch. If you place too high to be not in the retra, you forgot a small piece of vein here, here who passed laterally. If you place too low to have all the pedicle, you can be inside the, the retra. What I do? I just lift up superficially like that, just to, uh, to charge also the vein who runs laterally. Okay, I lift up to charge, then I turn. Can you turn on the other side? And I use the curvature of my needle to arrive a little bit lower, to be sure, or more or less sure, uh, because I'm sure of nothing, eh? I believe a lot of things, but I'm sure of nothing, but uh, to try to charge all the small branches who run uh, lower. Okay, when it's done, I repass with my suture more superficially because sometimes I lose the stitch and I'm not happy with that. And I pass more superficially. Uh, a little bit maybe in this tissue it looks a little bit more hard. And I pass my loop over. Then my knot will be placed really at the maximum as possible close to the the pubic bone. Uh, I've cut with my suture the dorsal vein. This is not a good idea. Yes, exactly. I need to repass for that reason. I hope that I will be not in trouble. You see what I told you before? When it's bleed from the dorsal plexus, but it's exactly like that. And I'm not sure that it will be possible to control that perfectly. It will be maybe continues to bleed like that a little bit. Wait, where's a good movement, this stretch. Maybe I will need to put a separate stitch for that. And probably it will stay not perfect because it should be a small collateral branch of the dorsal vein who was uh, big. It's still perfused, probably, and it can be my chance because if it's still perfused, probably the bleeding will stop alone. If it's completely tight, it's under pressure, it's continue to bleed. Okay. Down. Well, at this level, we have three planes. Okay. It's important to, to know that because if not, sometimes you will be in the good one, sometimes not in the good one. Stretch down. The plane that I want to find is the plane between the dodon villis fascia and the prostate. Okay. I just give small coagulation. I push down and I hope to enter in the good plane. And after, when I will be in the good plane, I will try to show you the wrong one. Section here. Mm, I have released a seminal vesicle. It's not the bipolar that I use normally, but well. Okay, this is the Donon Vides fascia, and you see that I start the plane section here. Is the plane to preserve the bundle? Huh? Is that plane? Section inside. Yeah. I free immediately. I don't care. I don't care about the small bleeding. And then with my grasp, I stay close to the prostate and I push laterally to free more the right side. Okay. And when I arrive close to the, the pedicle, I open my grasp. Okay. This is the plane between the, the, the non villis fascia and the prostate. And the advantage is if you continue laterally, you will pass naturally between the prostate and the bundle. The other plane is here, a little bit lower section. 
if you incise here, what we see is the fat. Do you see the fat there? I suppose yes. This is the fat of the perectal fat. It's the plane that we follow if we want to don't preserve the bundle and we want to do an enlarged radical prostatectomy. We incise here, we pass in the fat and we cut the pedicle very low. And the last one is the worst one, is that one. If you stay close to the seminal vesicle, it's possible to really enter inside the prostate. And you will realize that it's inside the prostate because this piece of tissue became thicker and thicker. Okay, but this is the good plane to preserve the bundle. Okay, two possibilities to dissect. The first is to do like in robotic, is to try to dissect already uh, the, the, the bundle laterally. But for me, when we do that, maybe we increase the tension on the bundle and we delay the recovery. The other possibility is, is to s look on the base and to start directly here with the hemolog. I think that I choose this solution for that place because the tip of my graph is uh, also not uh, uh, favorable to be used like a dissector. Hemolog. Bipolar. Okay, I coagulate just on the, the, the prostate side, it doesn't matter. Okay, don't push too much, it's okay. Hemolog. Yeah, before it was uh, more or less a uh, dry operating field. When we arrive at the bundle, it's always more red because we cannot coagulate too much and it's better to accept small bleeding because the patient expects to be potent after the surgery. No, the don't push laterally, it's always a vertical traction and sucky sucky. Oh, it was not a good idea because I have just an artery behind. Yes, is that one? That one I will coagulate gently up on the tip. Okay. Okay. Hear me? Action like that, yes. And section. Okay, hemolog. René, so do you find the plane immediately to laterally uh, go to the lateral part of the prostate in order to spare the bundle? This is uh, your, uh, your way. <laughs> <laughs> What is my way? This is a good question. I, I, I preserve only what the prostate accepts to give me, but I just try to find the, the, the plane along the prostate. In this case, I don't try to go laterally. I just follow the uh, posterior part of the prostate. You need to clean a little bit more. It's a bit red. Yeah, one more hemolog. I want to detach the the pedicle and after I should find the plane between the adenome, the, the prostate and the bundle itself. And I just close my clip close to the prostate uh, limit. I'm happy, I'm lucky today because the prostate is not very big but it's uh, enough hard to feel that I'm close to the prostate. It's here that I cannot miss a good turn. If I miss a good turn, I can miss also the bundle. Or I can enter in the prostate capsules. This is also the other possibility, hemolog. The biopsies were on positive on the left side, eh, if I remember.
when I arrive more at the level of the, the apex, we must remove the benique because the benique rigidify the prostate. Okay. Section. Mm -hmm. It can be the prostatic capsules. I must be careful with this patient because the tissues are not really strong and it's very easy to enter the prostate capsules. I think that this is the donor vides fascia. If it's the donor vides fascia, this is a part of the capsules. Okay. No, not push, to push down. Ah, one more hemolog. I still need to put one hemolog there. And after, I think that it will be enough. You find a very nice place, <clears throat> but sometime on the lateral part of the prostate there is uh, some big vein and um, it's very difficult to close it with the hemolog. Do you use a small clip, uh, um, metallic clip of a five millimeter that is helpful in this way? Uh, in fact, I think that with laparoscopy at least it's very hard to control that vein. But it doesn't matter, you can cut the vein, it bleeds, but when you close the space, it stops to bleed. And uh, I think that the only thing that is very important, you can remove the benique, I told you. You don't have to hear me. Okay. The, the most important is to control the arterial bleeding. Arterial bleedings are a problem. Venous bleeding, you close the patient, you do the anastomosis, and normally it stops alone. It's important to be not obsessed about the bleeding, because if we are obsessed about the bleeding, we finish to sacrifice nerves. I just, I'm just feel concerned about the arterial flow. Here the plane is not so clear. You must be careful to don't enter in the prostate capsules. If I have a doubt, I prefer to remove a part of the bundle. Huh? As you can see also, I try to minimize the tension on the bundle itself. I think that is the key for early recovery because uh, it's finally easy to preserve the anatomical aspect of the bundle. The most difficult part is to preserve the functional aspect. This is the end. I arrive at the level of the urethra. Here I, I'm under the urethra and uh, it's important because after when we cut the, the, the apex, it's uh, the good place also to cut the, the bundle at this level. Well, it's a little bit more red than what I want, but it's okay, that's life. Is the reason why I hate that surgery, <laughs> as everybody knows. And as I told you, the, the scissors is a better place for the right side, but no, with the left, the, the right side is completely free. It should be more easy to prepare the left side because I can tilt completely the prostate and I can free the Donon Villiers fascia more medially. But on this side, it seems a bit more adherent, maybe, section here. Okay, but the patient is still in erection, partially at least. You told me, you can answer me that it's uh, half erection because I have dissected half part of the bundle. <laughs> it's right. I have some liquid, so it comes outside the <laughs> tissue there. And I feel that I'm in the good plane, that, well, it's maybe inflammation. Okay, Emolok. So radical prostatectomy is better than Viagra. <laughs> then, then Viagra, no, uh, yes, uh, you, it's not completely false for one reason. I think that uh, in some case we can have a transitory improvement of the potency because we ligate the dorsal plexus. And uh, with the ligation of the dorsal plexus, we, we can maybe help patients who have the previously uh, venous leakage. But it's something that, uh, that is more evident in the milling. When uh, I perform laparoscopic milling, it's happened that the patient told me that the potency became better, at least just after the surgery for the first months. And my explanation is the fact that I ligate the dorsal plexus. Okay. 
This side seems not so easy because tissue is bigger. I use uh, the clip L. I think that the L for that is uh, maybe better than the XL because uh, we have more problem to lock the, the XL clip on the tissue than comparing with the L. This is my impression. I don't know if you have the same feeling. Yeah, <clears throat> I agree with you. Sometimes with the hemolock is very difficult in a petty patient to close the, <clears throat> the clip. And okay, hemolock. A problem that nobody speaks about the hemolock you know, is the risk of migration of the clip. I have patients who, who, with the clips who arrive inside the bladder. Do you have already that kind of patient? Or I'm the only one in the world? One more time. I have had, this evangelist, I've had three patients with migration in the bladder. Yeah, yeah, you see. Yeah. And where I had done a perfect anastomosis and very few clips on the sides, and I was amazed. It happened, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, ast it's ast astonished me also because I never put clips uh, close to the apex. And I believe that I was protected against that kind of story. But it seems that when we do the anastomosis, the clip moves, the pedicle moves down, and the clips follow the movement and arrive finally not so far from the pedicle, from the, from the, the anastomosis. Okay, hemolog. Well, for the moment, it seems not bad. It's a bit red for demonstration, but that's life. But at least the most important will be the final functional result. And you will see normally that when the bladder will be attached, the bleeding will stop alone. I hope. Okay, give me one second. You are not enough active for the moment because we have a lot of club. Maybe we can rinse a little bit more, yeah. Stretch here, yes, vertically like that. And try to sucky sucky if you can. I cut and I push with the tip of my scissors. Huh? I think that uh, we don't have doubt about the preservation. Ah, here I have a small arterial flow, you seen it? Now it's already stopped, more or less. On this side, I have a lot of big veins. Uh, suction uh, here, it's okay. Vein first. And stretch down here. Okay, can you pass under here? Yes, good. Yeah, it's a big vein on the prostate side, which is open. Well, the second bundle is down, and the patient has not a hard erection like Rocco Sifredi, but uh, is still of at least partial in erection. And I am happy. We will control the bleeding from the posterior part later. I want just to remove the prostate node to make place. Uh, can I have the Benike? <laughs> can you show me closer? Well. Those are plexus. Oh, nice. The stitches uh, goes away. Yeah. And we need another suture because, uh, as you can see, the tissue is slide outside the, the tissue. Well, well, it's happened. Doesn't matter. Up. Is enough? No, I think it's better to put a stitch. I replace the suture, yeah, suture here, and, uh, okay, no, don't move the benique. I pass in the lowest part of the pedicle, 
I don't waste uh, the time to suture. I just do a running suture. Okay, I think that now it's enough. The knot is a little bit released. I want just to reclose the first one. I maintain stretch if I want, and then I close the second one on the first. Is it possible the the water is open? I'd like to rinse. No, no, in the section, section uh, irrigation in the. Okay, well, I continue to cut the extra. No, because I have a good vision. Can you come inside with the camera? When I cut the, the urethra, the apex, I like to cut first the peri tissue before to cut the urethra because like that I see much better, I think, the, the limit of the, the prostate, particularly the posterior part of the, the prostate, of the apex. Okay, this is the urethra itself. Yeah, move back the penic here. Yeah, we see that we have preserved a nice quality tissue and a good length. Oops, sorry. But what's happened usually is when we finish to cut, the urethra seems to go back. Well, the bag, sacchetto. Okay. Well, of course, uh, now it's well known how to manage the prostate. We just put the prostate in the bag, uh, and then uh, we pull the string of the bag outside laterally uh, to a port. Okay. Then I pass one grasp inside the port. Okay. Come out just to show here. Do you have it? I dislodge the port. I take the string, I replace the port, and I pull on the string. And normally the bag will arrive uh, beha beside the... Uh, the hole is a bit small, I maybe need to remove more. Okay, and I have the, the, the grasp still inside to, to drive the port. And now the, the bag is uh, laterally placed to the port. The space is completely free for the anastomosis, and you see the prostate is there, and my port is still free. Okay? Well, we can check if it bleeds too much or not. For me, it's not really dramatic. Not? Okay. What I well, what I do know is a suspension, is a, rock, is a modification of the Rocco technique. I think that for me, the Rocco technique, the theory is very good because it's sure that the mobility of the posterior part of the urethra is the key of the incontinence. Then uh, what I do, I use the, um, the, the, um, the arcus tendis of the elevated animal to pass a knot here, and then posteriorly to the urethra between the, wait one second, no, stay right, stay this direction. I need to catch the tissue between the prostate section here, down, stretch down, and suck it, suck it. I'm not inside the retra, I'm between the, the retra and the bundle, and it will pull inside and stabilize inside the, the, the retra, the posterior plate of the retra. And for me, it's, uh, I believe, stronger 
attachment that the, the, the rebuilding of the rocker stitch because with this technique we don't fix on the Norvedi's fascia with a, a very smooth tissue is uh, more in the, the in the arcus tendinus it doesn't matter because I would restretch from the other side also and um, the arcus tendinus in the female pelvic reconstructive surgery is considered as a strong structure as Tibet showed you yesterday, we must be careful because we know that the nerve is passing lower. Is the reason why I pass horizontally in the muscles and not vertically to be sure to don't arrive inside the pudendal nerve. The advantage with this uh, knot is also easy comparing another suture. Comparing with the rocker stitch, it's easy to, to, to do it laparoscopically, but also in open. In open, it's difficult to do a rocker stitch because uh, you don't have a lot of space. But um, this uh, suture is reproducible independently of the technique of the prostatectomy. The other needle driver? Reno, do you have any pain on these patients with this uh, suture pulling the m fibromuscular uh, layer there? Do you have no. any? No. No. Usually the patient doesn't have complaints about pain. What's the specific risk is the urinary tension. And something that it's happened, it, it's never, it's really unusual after six days of catheterization when we do a normal prostatectomy without that stitch. But uh, we know that uh, also with six days of, surge, of uh, catheterization, we can have some patients who are in urinary tension after the, the suspension. You got it? And for my colleagues who, who, who tried them, okay, remove. They found also that at one month, the continent suite is much better. And as you can see at the beginning, before that I put the stitch, the anterior part of the urethra was long, but it was the posterior part who was short because it was sliding inside, the, pel inside the, the muscle wall and now we have a long stump anteriorly and posteriorly. Do you agree or not? <laughs> Silence in the room. Oh, it's logic. But my, yeah, my, a my concern, a short my concern is the tension. That's my concern. Yeah, but it's also resorbable suture. Huh? You see that I have a small arterial flow there that I want to control. I'm uh, just a little bit too close to the, the anastomosis to put a clip there. And I will try to catch this animal with the suture. Reno. Yes? Alberto, just a question. Uh, when you do, when you have such a small bleeder, do you think that a small bipolar uh, would really hurt the bundle? I don't know, but I'm sure that with the suture is better. <laughs> no, it's not better, but I'm sure that the suture is 100% safe. But I agree. I, I, I recognize that sometimes I'm tired, and I put a small coagulation, and that's it. But I think that nobody can answer you. Okay, no, that's good. I must check the bladder neck because it was a bit large. And just release the grasp here. Question. Um, uh, since you're placing these two mm. sutures, uh, um, do you think that the rocker stitch is basically the same as these two sutures? The problem is the rocker stitch uses this tissue. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you see how it's mobile? Mm -hmm. Do you believe really that when the patient is stand up, is the urethra who comes inside, or do you think that is the, the novidis who goes down? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is my concern here. You can push really here. It's very hard. You cannot move down. You cannot move back the tissue. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, I think that the theory of rocker stitch is excellent. Maybe it's the biggest improvement during the, the last 10 years uh, concerning the continents. But the, the manner to treat for me seems not maybe the most efficient. Mm -hmm. But I, I cannot prove that. Huh? It's just, it seems for me to be logical that if you want to 
have a good anchorage, you must have a, a, good, uh, a good place to fix the anchorage. If it's mobile, don't, we know that it will be better than nothing, but maybe it's not the optimum part. It's a little bit like if you want to do a promoter fixation and you will fix the mesh in the tissue is not very strong. Mm. No? Yeah. Mm. It, it makes sense, but I cannot prove it. <laughs> right. But I hope that uh, we have a lot of uh, big scientists in the room, and I hope that at least one of them will try that. We do a, a, put a, to, pu to publish a paper, and they will not forget that it was me who showed him the technique. <laughs> but well. Well, the brand neck was uh, a little bit enlarged, but really not too much. It's important to don't close too much. If not, it's a nightmare to do the anastomosis. Huh? I think that I will stop here because I don't want to fight after to find where is the blood and neck exactly. Well, the surgery will be finished normally soon. I, I have uh, maybe 20 minutes. It will be done. The most difficult part is finished. Is the dissection. Yeah, I can cut that. And reduce the length of the other one, yeah. Good, suture and section to clean the field. Okay, no the anastomosis. Um, no, uh, I use a, a simple vehicle tool as like, like in home, at home. I know that um, the, um, the suture, the barbed suture can help you can help people, but I try to be more with the technique that it's available everywhere. Oh, the mattress is not far away. Renaud. Yes? Just a question, a general question. I mean, the need for the Rocco stitch came in robotic surgery, uh, and because of the big inclination they had, the Trendelleborg that they had to do, so there was a, a, a huge tension when they were pulling down the anastomosis. Now, when when you're doing laparoscopy, and especially what I've seen with you, that you have such a small inclination, such a small Trendelleborg on the patient, and do you really think that this suture reduces the tension now? I mean, what tension? Do you think it's not coming down easily? Or no, 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 no. The, the Rocco stitch is not just to make my life more easy for the anastomosis. This is nothing. This is really nothing. The, the most important... Uh, with the rocker stitch for me is to stabilize the urethra after the surgery to don't have the urethra who enter inside the, the, the muscles of the perineum is never for the surgery itself and maybe they have this idea first and then they remark after that it was better for the continents we can reduce it, the pressure la, la, the pneumoperitoneum please reduce at 10 10 yeah, and open the valve to F10 because I have still 12. Okay. Okay. Okay, this is, uh, I think that for me, the Rocco stitch is a continence improvement, is not a technical detail. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, it's uh, the reason why I think that it's uh, uh, so big improvement for the, the continence uh, knowledge. It's because it's, uh, for me, uh, uh, probably one key of the continence for the patient. But the problem is the manner to stabilize the urethra. Here, as you can hear, I has to decrease the pressure. I don't have to decrease the trend position. And it's important to notice that because the problem with the extra approach can be the tension on the anastomosis. It's not due to the trend and bogo is more limited, but it's due to the pressure inside the peripetonal space who push back the, the, the who push back the the peritoneum and the bladder. This is too anterior a bit also, but we'll see. Section inside, please, to sucky sucky the place, actually, yeah.
Ah, I hear that somebody has finished. We missed the first train. You missed the second one. Also. Ah. <laughs> Not a good idea. <laughs> Not a good news, huh? You break, you kill me for the rest of the day. <laughs> But we never said this is a competition of speed, did we? No, 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 of course not. The most important is to try to, to be demonstrative and to explain small tips and tricks to maybe help people to have their life more easy. But no, I know that I can take more time. Huh? It's too late. I'm the last. Do you always do the reconstruction on the posterior side? Do you? No. I mean, uh, no, here it was because it was a bit too large. I no. did a mistake. I put a small tension, excess of tension uh, during the, the, the incision of the, the blood and neck. No, I mean, when you decide to do a reconstruction, you always do it on the posterior side? You never do it anteriorly? No, the, the reconstruction of the urethra, no, because for me, the mobilization of the urethra concerned more the anterior part, never the, the posterior part. Not the anterior one. The anterior one is still fixed. Here, it's well fixed at this level between the, with the suspensory ligament. The problem is the posterior one that we, is more mobile, uh, and not suture, <coughs> it's more mobile posteriorly. Uh, for me, the, um, the problem is that way. I have already tried in the past to, to fix, the, uh, to fix the, the, the anterior one, to rebuild the suspension to replace the, the ligament who were cut, or uh, I have already preserved the ligament, but I'd never see a real difference. The only thing that I, I remarked who was efficient, seems efficient, was the posterior one. And I tried different techniques to stabilize the, the posterior part, but I think that this one is the most uh, reproducible and the most efficient. Because I try also to use the Cooper ligament, but the angle of the Cooper ligament are not good then you don't uh, pull in the direction of the urethra, you, you, you obtain like a balancing effect and the posterior part of the urethra stay mobile. I think that uh, th with the, the technique here, the posterior part of the urethra is, uh, uh, has a better fixation. Oh, I took the second one, not the first one. Okay. You need to clean better. Maybe we please uh, the grasp, the proper grasp to also retract a little bit to free the hand of uh, Raquel. Section in the corner here. Yeah, okay. Well, like that, it's okay. I just need to have a small view. Remove the section once again. Yes. Not in the muscles fibers, I prefer. It's not exactly the needle that I use. Usually I prefer the CT2 is uh, stronger. This one is a SH, so, uh, it can be more easy to destroy the needle. You never use the 5.8? The UR5, the, you know the... No. You don't I like it? I don't have the impression that it helps me because usually the 5.8 uh, is uh, too small. The curvature is maybe better, but you cannot load so easily in one shot the tissue like here. You see, I, I load the tissue, the bladder, and I push the tip of my needle inside, and I turn the needle just to sh see where it's come out, and I push the needle parallel to the urethra, and it's like the ski on the snow. The tip of the needle appears, but you can do that only if you have a, a, a length of needle long enough. If it's 5.8, it's difficult to do that. You, the, I think that the 5.8 needle is a good suture for an expert because you must uh, really respect the curvature of the needle, which is not so uh, important here. And um, I always try to have a technique who is uh, as possible reproducible. Because uh, I have uh, fellows who try to do the same. And I always tell to them, don't try to use uh, the needle as an expert. Because it's very difficult to do. I don't know if I have shows, if I choose the good moment. No, maybe I will need to put one more uh, transversally before. 
too tight because if not, I will have a small anterior racket who will be not completely closed. This one is better. Okay. Scissors. And catheter, and it will be done. No, the 18, 18 is enough. Doesn't matter. Okay. That's it. No, no, second needle driver. No, no, three. I have the, you had the two needles on the table? Okay. Okay, you can remove the benique and you can put the catheter. Yeah. Okay. Then, okay, move back, remove. Can you take the bag to avoid the loose? I check, as I told you before, then I received the catheter. I test the water tightness. It's not for my self satisfaction. Because sometimes it's uh, watertight, no, and it will be not when, the, when you want to remove the catheter. But it's just because if you have a big leakage, you know that the catheter is not inside the bladder, but through the anastomosis. We can connect. May I have a drain? The Blake, or the, yes, the, the Jackson Pot or this one, a grasp. No question in the room or remark? No. There's no further questions. Any comments by you? No. My final comments? No. I think that it, I'm happy for the case today. It was an easy case. Can you give me the, the grasp, please, to place a, position the grasp to position the drain? It was an easy case. Uh, the prostate is... Uh, independently of the technique, but also with the robot, uh, difficult surgery. You cannot believe that because you have a robot, the life is so easy. It's a tricky surgery. I don't know, do, do you always place a drain? Yes. There's a, there's, I always do too, but there's a lot of people that start saying that, that you don't yes. need a drain if you're dry. But It's uh, my rain dance. Yeah. I remember a patient, it's always the same, huh? You put drains, silk, silk, we can switch on the light. Uh, you put a drain for one accident each, yeah, each uh, 200. But uh, I remember a patient who was witness Jehovah, yeah. and uh, I put a drain, and I go just to see a patient, and they call me back because the drain gives uh, uh, 600 milliliters in uh, 30 minutes. Yeah. And I returned in the patient, and I was very happy because, in fact, he has a very big vein to bleed, who start to bleed in the wall. And the hemoglobin level of the patients arrive uh, around six the day yeah. after. Huh? Yeah. Well, I imagine with a drain, it's one guy who die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and it's always the same. I put a drain just for him yeah. because every day when I put, I do a prostate. I remember that I can kill a patient just because I don't want to put a drain for my self-satisfaction. I agree. I think that the mobility of a drain is zero. Yeah. And for me, if you have a patient who dies from an hemorrhage and you don't have put a drain, you go to the jail. But I agree. Thank you very much. That was a great procedure, Renaud. Thanks. Thank you.